So as Debbie had mentioned, the subject is the Bet Migdash, which is what we're studying now very assiduously during this three-week mourning period, because as our sages tell us, by studying the laws of the Bet Migdash, we hasten its reappearance, or more specifically and more accurately, we spiritually build it so that it will be ultimately physically manifest here on earth with, with Mashiach's coming without delay. Amen. So today we're going to look at one particular law of the construction of a detail in the Holy Temple. And as we always do, raise a question, a difficulty, offer some solutions, challenge the solutions, and then offer a final resolution that answers the problem. And finally, the spiritual message, a very profound spiritual message for each of us. Okay, friends, so the Holy Temple, actually, yeah, here's a kind of a picture, if you can see this, the front cover of this book. So this is the temple. This area here, oh, this backwards, is the Temple Mount. Temple proper is this structure here. But the actual heart of the temple is this tall building called the Heichel, often referred to simply in English as the sanctuary. Can you see it there? Yeah. And the rest of the temple was primarily open courtyards. The priestly courtyard that surrounded that building, and then the Israelite courtyard and the women's courtyard, which was the largest open area in the temple complex largest area altogether. We're referring today, we're looking at this building. As we discussed last week, this building has three compartments. As you go from east to west, so first you encounter the entrance hall and then you encounter the holy which he spoke about last week the three sacred vessels that were in the holy and then separated by a curtain actually two curtains was the Kurdish Akadoshim, the holy of holies so all these three chambers comprise the heichel it was a very tall structure 150 cubits high so here is Here's the particular law we're going to zero in on this morning, and that is Maimonides rules, based on a statement of our sages, that the Heichel requires a guardrail, the three cubit high guardrail. What's a guardrail? In Hebrew, a mica. A mica is an obligation that we need a guardrail that we must put up around any elevated building. Anything that is more than 10 handbreadths high that a person could fall and injure themselves, if it's accessible, then it must have a guardrail. As mentioned, it was a very tall building. So the Rambam says at the top was a, a guardrail like uh, one would have to do in any dwelling or any building that is elevated. Um, I think I mentioned this when we, we bought this house here, as in many homes. So the, uh, the driveway to the garage is on an incline going down. Then you have the walkway adjacent to that going up to the front door. So there's a drop at some point. It's more than 10 hand breaths. At any rate, there is a drop um, where the person walks up the, the walkway to the incline of the garage below. 
So this walkway requires, therefore, a guardrail, which we put up. The original home didn't have it. It had only a, a, a railing getting very close to the house, but not as you walked up to the house from the street. And as you walked up, or even level, because the garage driveway went down into the basement, and it created this height that required a guardrail along the entire walkway up to the house. So back to the law here, the law is the Rambam says that the Beis Hamikdash, the Heichal, this building likewise requires a guardrail. Now that is a big problem. Why should it require a guardrail? Why should it not? Because when the Torah commands us to put a guardrail, it says as follows. When you build a new house, you shall make a guardrail for your roof. Your roof, the individual, the private property requires a guardrail, exempting synagogues and house of study from this obligation because they're not your private property. So that begs the question, if a synagogue, a Beis HaKnesses, and the Beis HaMedrej do not require a guardrail, then why does the Beis HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, require a guardrail? We would think the same principle would apply to it. Why is it the exception? All right? Our question is clear. Yes. Shuls, houses of study, because they're not your private home, the Torah addresses the individual. And they don't belong to the individual. They belong to the community. Therefore, they're exempt. Well, surely that's true of the Holy Temple. So here's an attempted answer, which we shall refute. The attempted answer is this. When the temple was built, it wasn't built initially while it's being built. I'm talking about during the process of it being built. It didn't have any sanctity till the very end. One of the simple reasons for that is this allows for, you know, all of the construction and so on and people coming and going and building and going to places where normally we may not go like the area of the Holy of Holies, but it doesn't become the Holy of Holies until it's complete. While it's being constructed, it uh, doesn't have the status of a, of the Holy Temple. So therefore the, attempted answer here is when it was being built it wasn't built as a holy place initially of course that was the intent but it did not have that sanctity deliberately it is built not with the intent during the construction process that we're building a sacred place again allowing therefore for all of the necessary building um, activities so therefore it's built like an ordinary building only the very end when it's all complete it's sanctified and dedicated as the Holy Temple. Therefore, the suggested answer is, since before it's sanctified, after all has been completed, it's an ordinary building, but an ordinary building requires a guardrail. That's why they put up the guardrail. Only after they sanctified it, after the, the construction process, process was completely was completed, only then was it sanctified. So then afterwards, it wouldn't need the guardrail, but it did initially because when the physical building was complete, before the dedication ceremony that dedicated it as the Holy Temple, it was then an ordinary building and therefore it requires a guardrail. Whereas shuls and synagogues are built to begin with at the very outset with the sanctity of a shul, a synagogue, or a yeshiva. And therefore at no point was it obligated to have a guardrail. The temple does because of the when it's built, it wasn't built as is with sanctity yet. The sanctity is revealed in it later, not during construction. Whereas a yeshiva or a shul, from the very outset, we are building, and the intent is, and the sanctification is a holy building. Therefore, it never acquired the guardrail because it was holy from the outset. 
Whereas the temple is only holy later after it's complete. This is the answer suggested by the Rabbi Yosef Rosen, the famous Robert Show God. With all due respect, the Rebbe rejects this answer on three grounds. I'll only mention two of them. The first ground is you may have been thinking this yourself. The issue here is not sanctity or otherwise. The issue here is private dwelling or public. So even when they built the temple, it's, it's surely irrelevant that it was only sanctified later. It was never a private dwelling, so never should require a guardrail. The issue at hand here is not sanctity and not sanctity. It's private versus public. The temple is always public. First, it wasn't built. When it was initially, as it was built, it wasn't sanctified. Later, it was sanctified. But it has nothing to do whatsoever with the fact that at the outset, it was a public building. So why should it be different from the synagogue and from the yeshiva? The issue is not sanctity. It's private ownership versus public ownership. So that's one reason to reject this solution. And the second reason is, the law is that let's say you had a private house and you, and you had a roof that was accessible, a flat roof. So you put your railing as you're commanded to do. Then you sold it or you gave it away and it became a shul. The law is you can take it down. It's no longer required to be there. So even if they put the, the railing as they were building it, once the temple was sanctified, uh, they could remove it once it became the holy temple. So on these two grounds, we have to reject this solution. The issue is not sanctity. The issue is private or public. Our question remains. The public shul, the public synagogue, the public yeshiva doesn't require a guardrail. Only private dwellings. Why would the temple, which is surely a public uh, edifice belonging to the Jewish people, why does it require a guardrail? Simple question. Agreed? Yeah, we've all, we all get the question. Uh, yep, so, a nod. Okay, good. I don't know why I'm not seeing. All right, shy. So now we're going to suggest an answer by first kind of asking another question. The law is, what about partners? It's not your individual, you're sharing this, you're a co-owner of a building or several partners. Do they does it require a guardrail? The answer is yes. So we need to understand this. It's, it's not yours, you're sharing it with somebody else. Why does this require a guardrail, a house owned or a building? owned in partnership, and why do synagogues uh, and houses of study do not require a guardrail? Let's put aside the temple right now. Now we're just comparing, let's talk about the synagogue to keep it simple, the synagogue and a house owned in partnership. Neither are one individual's private dwelling. The Torah says, Gagecha, your roof, referring to one person. So we have a discrepancy here. Synagogue, it's not yours. No guardrail. But a house in partnership, it's also not exclusively mine. It's somebody else. Why does that require a guardrail? Answer. Why is there a guardrail in the first place? Because someone shouldn't fall down and injure themselves. Now, why would any building be exempt? The danger is present and certainly a public building. A building that is accessible to people coming and children and so on and so forth, surely it should require a guardrail. So what's the whole logic behind all, all of this? So the answer, friends, is, well, you should put a guardrail, but we can't obligate you to. Why not? I'm talking about a shul now. Answer. A shul belongs to every Jew in the world. So you should know that. Wherever you go, you have the right to go into the shul or the house of study, study there, learn there. If there's a place of lodging, to lodge there. And therefore, so when a community builds a shul, we say to them, you have to build a guardrail. 
in theory, they can say, fine, collect the money also from every Jew in the world. It's not just ours. This belongs to everybody. And since that's not possible, we can't put that obligation on this little, on the local community because it doesn't just belong to them. It belongs to everybody. So you can't make us uh, obligated. Now again, of course they should, and they obviously will. But we're talking now about the theory of the law, the obligation. Is it obligated? Who we, the answer is, who are we gonna come to make, to, 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 to collect the funds from? We can't just come to the local population, the, the, the townsfolk, because they, they you know, will argue, this is a legal argument, you're coming to us and you collect from everybody. But partners, yes, because you've got defined partners, they have to put their guard. We do have people to, who, are, who are partners in a private dwelling. We, the law is, you guys own it. It's defined. You can't pass it off to anybody else. You're the owners. Put the guardrail. So what's the difference, are we clear now, between the synagogue and a building that has partners the building that has partners, we'll soon get to the temple, bring that aside now. The building that has partners requires a guardrail because we have the defined partners. You're obligated. You know, if it's two, 50%, you pay for the cost. If there's three, 33% and so on. You divide it up amongst the, the, the defined partners. But when it comes to a synagogue, since a synagogue, a shul belongs to everybody, we can't put that obligation, that onus, on this, on these people. All right. So now I've answered. We're clear. We've answered this little problem right now. The distinction between a building in partnership and a shul. Now again, I, I keep on, you know, just to make it clear. It doesn't, you know, obviously the, the the people of the town will put it up because it's a danger. But we just now speak about the theory of it, the obligation. It belongs to every Jew, so collect. We'll, we'll pay our due, like everybody else. Having said this, friends, we'll understand why the Holy Temple is unlike a shul. And for very simple, brilliant reason, insight. The Holy Temple was actually built from the money of all Jews. Just like the Mishkan in the desert. The Mishkan in the desert was built as a result of the donations by the entire population. Mind you, the women gave more than the men. They were the first to donate and they gave in great abundance. Their jewelry and so on. The same is true of the Beta Migdash. When King David laid the groundwork for it and built it, well, at least the groundwork, King Solomon built it, but laid the groundwork, he collected from every tribe and everybody wanted to be part of the base of Mikdash. So it's like, it's like the whole, it is on the one hand, the entire Jewish people, but hey, we've got their funds. Everybody contributed. So we've got to build the guardrail. That's different to a shul in a, loca in a, a local town. We can't come to the people and say, build your guardrail, the court, you know, because they're gonna say, fine, we'll do our part, but get from everybody. Here, the, the reality is everybody did contribute. So that's the reason why, now we have our reason. Why does the Beis HaMikdash require a guardrail? It's just like a building of partners because all, Jew, all Jews were partners. So with the funds that were contributed to the building of the Beis HaMikdash, a guardrail had to be put up on the top of the, of the, of the sanctuary. However, a synagogue and a shul, they built it. They built it for everyone. They everybody contribute and participate. So we can't put the onus on the people that actually built it. Temple is different because it was actually built with the money from everybody. Are we clear? We're clear with the answer? Yes? A nod. Chai, is that a nod or what? It, no. You got a question? So, do you? I'm following your gestures there. Good, we good. Yeah? <laughs> I'm going to mute everybody for a second. 
So if anybody has a question right now, please ask. Okay, you can, you can unmute yourself, friends. You're good. No question. Anybody has a question? We, we continue? All right. So we continue to mute all. all. Okay. But you can unmute yourself as, as you see fit. So far, so good. Now let's summarize. Private dwellings, of course, require a guardrail. Dwellings that are owned by a co-op, by a partnership, also require a guardrail. Synagogues do not, because it belongs to everybody and you can't collect from everybody. You can't put the onus on the ones that actually built it, the community that built it. They built it as all synagogues on behalf of all the Jewish people. But then you would know. That's the law. Temple? Yes, a guardrail. Because in fact, it was. We do have the funds that were given by everybody. It's like a, a it's the ultimate partnership. All Jews are partners in this building. Clear. We have us the one more problem. The problem is this, friends. The Torah says that you are to build a guardrail on your dwelling. Your dwelling. Now, what's the definition of a dwelling? First of all, a place that you live. People didn't live in the Heichel. In this sanctuary, nobody dwelled, nobody lived. So why is it obligated in a, in a guardrail? It's a building, true, that's built by communal funds, and we have the funds, but there's another qualification that is required for a building to have a guardrail, and that is, has to be a bayit, a place of dwelling. Okay, it's God's house, but not ours. Surely, God invites us into his home. So our question is, the Bet Amigdash, the Heichel, I mean, this building doesn't qualify, it seems, because it isn't a place of dwelling. There's the holy there, the holy of holies, but it's not a dwelling place. So the Rebbe answers a brilliant answer. What's the definition of a dwelling in Halacha? I want to ask you. On Sukkot, we're obligated to what? Uh, to live in the Sukkot. This must become our place of dwelling. Please tell me. You're all unmuted, so you can, anybody can offer an answer. What is the singular activity, if you like, that defines home or dwelling that we see in the sukkah? Is it sleeping? No, Chabad doesn't sleep in the sukkah. So what makes it a dwelling? Hmm? Is it eating? Pardon? Pardon? Is it eating? That's right. Eating there is what makes it a dwelling place. So here's the interesting law. Even though conventionally there was no eating in the Heichel, not in the entrance room, not in the Holy, and not in the Holy of Holies. The Kohanim did eat meat from the sacrifices. They ate, conventionally, they ate the meat in the priestly courtyard. However, the law is under pressure, God forbid, surrounded by Gentiles who are laying siege to the temple, then the law is that the Koenim should eat in the sanctuary, in the Heichel. And that's actually derived from a verse that the verse says, they shall eat their meat in the sacred, implying that although they're eating in the courtyard, but they really could be eating in the sacred temple itself. So we have our answer. Our answer is, our question was, but the Heichel is not a place of dwelling. The Rebbe says it is. Since in theory, the Kohenim could eat their meat there, the sacrificial food, that makes it a place of dwelling. Conclusion, therefore, is the Heichel, the sanctuary, the temple building proper, right, requires a guardrail because A, it's like a building of partners, Everybody participated. We have the funds, build it. It also qualifies as a dwelling place 
because under certain circumstances, one can eat there. And for that matter, I should just add, even if a Kayan, there was no threat, a Kayan just decided to take a sacrificial meat and go into the Eichel and eat it there, it's permissible. It's not considered eating the meat in the wrong place. Because as I mentioned, scripture seems to indicate that on some level, it's the place where you should consume your offering. In practice, it's the courtyard, but really you're all on some level in the, the, the Kohen, that is, in the Heichel. And again, the law, black and white law. If necessary, you can eat there. And eat there, eating makes it, defines it as a dwelling place. So far, my friends, for the legalities of this law, we had asked a question. The original question was, what's the difference between the temple, the Beisamigdor, the Heichel, and synagogues? Synagogues don't require a guardrail. The temple does. And we have offered the final resolution. And in summary, it is. Because when it comes to a synagogue, you need to collect that from everybody. And that is simply not possible. And you cannot make this local town the sole uh, uh, carriers of this obligation because they built it on behalf of everyone. Temple is different because everybody, in fact, did participate, just like a building of partners that requires a guardrail. As for the problem, it's not a dwelling place. It is because, in theory, the sacrificial food can be consumed and eaten in the heichal, in the temple. So far, so good. Mm. Now the spiritual dimension. <clears throat> that is as follows, friends. So what does the Torah say? What's, what's the spiritual meaning behind this law? The Torah says when you build a new house, which means an elevated uh, structure, you must put a guardrail, listen to the words carefully, to prevent the faller from falling. Which is a strange expression, to prevent the faller from falling. You'd expect the verse to have said, to prevent the person from falling. He's not a faller till he falls. So you want to prevent him from falling in the first place. So the verse should have said to prevent a person, somebody else from falling, falling off it. This is going to be very relevant, this little nuance in our spiritual explanation. Actually, since I pointed it out now, I'll tell you what, what uh, our sages say. Our sages say that this person was destined to fall. For his own karma, for want of a better word, or history. But you shouldn't be the agency by which it happens. If it has to happen, you make sure that you have no part in this. God will, God will find another way. Or he may rectify his, his, uh, his, own, his own story and not have to fall. All right? That, that's the answer offered by our sages. We'll soon get to the spiritual meaning of this. He's already a faller. We shouldn't fall off your building. He's destined to. If it has to happen, but not through you. You make sure that your hands are clean. Don't you be the agent for God to, uh, um, not administer, but for God to uh, dispense his, his, uh, his punishment or his justice. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is that a strange language? Do we see elsewhere where we put on a person, designate what their future sin will be? The, or not sin. He's not, he's, he's not sin. sin. He's, he's the consequence of no, the sin. No, I know. I mean, future, future destiny. Like, As I recall right now, no. There may be one other case. Something is, some bell is ringing in the back of my head, but I, I don't think so. This could be the only case. In, so, and I also had a, another question, but I couldn't unmute. Do we also say that the problem, not just with the collection, but then the liability? Like, yeah, and the liability, same thing, exactly. Yeah. Who's to be liable if it belongs to everybody? 
Okay, the truth is it's a very, it's a complex study because it may belong to everyone, but they are the custodians, so they should be liable. So it could be liability is different. You built it on behalf of everyone, but you're still responsible for it. So it's more, you know, the legality of to obligate them to pay for it when they're not the sole owners, it belongs to everybody. So that's the legality of it. And again, as we pointed out, of course, every, every, every community would put a guardrail because, you know, just for practical purposes. But your, the point that you raise is, is interesting. If they're not obligated to put it up, then they can't be held liable either. So I think, no, I think you're right. It's also liability. Can't have one without the other. If you're liable, then you have to be obligated. Yeah, good point. All right. So now the spiritual dimension of all this now. So you build an elevated structure, you got to put a guardrail. What does this mean? It means when a person spiritually elevates himself, his observance, his study, his piety, there is the inherent danger of a sense of arrogance and superiority that comes along with spiritual advancement. I'm holy. The Torah says, put a guardrail, contain your ego. And the guardrail is put on the top like it's an attitude thing. That's the head. As you're rising in your knowledge and observance, there is human nature to feel a sense of, of uh, achievement, which is not a bad thing, an accomplishment. But the often partner and sister to achievement is, I am better than the other fellow. So the first message here is spiritually, as you build your own spiritual structure, an elevated structure, a tall structure, you achieve great heights in your Torah study, in your observance, in your charity, and all of your mitzvahs, be very careful to put the guardrail around yourself and not allow, God forbid, your arrogance to taint, I won't say destroy it all, but compromise it all. Taint it all. That's the first message. But as we have seen, and when I quoted the verse, when the verse says, when you build your new house, put a guardrail, it's more concerned with somebody else falling off than you. So here's the thing. Rabbi, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to continue explaining, pardon? Okay. No, no, it's okay. Yeah, let me continue explaining and probably will answer your question. Okay, okay. Well, no problem. You're asking on the new point or an old point? No, it's probably going to, I might say what you're going to say, so. If it's the one we're about to talk about, which is why you want to explain why the temple needs a guardrail and synagogues do not. I'm going to explain this now spiritually. So the Torah is concerned with, again, the other person falling. What does this mean? The inherent danger of your own advancement being a turn off to others. You're calling other, causing other people to fall. You're preaching. You're conveying a sense of holier than thou. You're critical. And that's going to cause people to literally, you know, turn away and fall. They may have made some advancement, but now they're going to regress and fall away from guy. Now the person might say, and here's where the faller falls. Listen carefully. The Torah says the faller will fall. The person we're addressing might say, this isn't fair. Excuse me. What I'm saying is true. Okay, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm not perfect. And there's this sense of my own uh, ego coming through. But so what? The listener should be able to discern and separate from me and the message. Is the message true? Is what I'm saying is right, right? 
So what if the one that's saying it, you know, is aggravated and, 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 and has all of these uh, um, uh, faults, and he admits I have these faults. You know, I get angry and, I, uh, and, uh, and a sense of superiority. So what? But the listener should be able to discern. He's a faller. He's a faller or before he heard my words, he's a faller. If there's such a word exists. Because if he, if he wasn't, he'd be able to take my words and, 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 and get the message and, and disregard the messenger. Like a fruit that has a shell, you take the fruit and you discard the shell. Eat the inside and reject the outside. So the listener to my words should do the same. And the fact that he's not, because he's already, he was a faller before, don't blame me. And yet the Torah says, yet the Torah says, your listener is imperfect, nobody is. And your listener cannot separate between you and your message, which in theory one should be able to do. But this person can because they're a faller, they're not on, on, on any elevated plane. Don't you be the one to push them further. That's the incredible message here. That even if ki yipel hanoifel, for the faller will fall. The Torah is saying that your listener, you know, it, in theory you're arguing, should be able to, to, to hear what you're saying because objectively it's the emiss, it's the truth. And if they can't, it's because of their own low spiritual standing, their own descent. Nonetheless, the Torah says, you cannot make them, you cannot be responsible for a further descent. So put up a guardrail and contain and contain your self, your own agenda and your own arrogance. So now a person might say, you know what? I'm going to say nothing. I know that I'm, I'm not perfect. And if what I'm going to say, since it doesn't, you know, it may come from a place that's not pure because there's an element here of pride and of, uh, of uh, holier than thou, so I'll keep silent and I won't have an influence on my environment. I won't talk to anybody, won't invite anybody because I'm just, I'm afraid that uh, I, might, I might turn the person off. The Torah says you have no such right. Because the verse reads like this, when you build a new house, that the fact is it could be an old house. Does, what do you mean, why a new house? It doesn't have to be new. Could be a house that exists. You didn't even build it, you bought it. It's an old one, like my story with my railing. So why is the Torah stressing you? The Torah is saying this because every situation we find ourselves is divinely orchestrated. It's a new situation that I need to engage. A Jew has to be a builder and constantly influencing and building. Yiddishkeit, wherever he goes, inspiring and influencing others. And if you don't do it, who's going to do it? Because this person has met you by divine providence. They're in your circle. It's something novel that you need to contribute. And if you don't, it doesn't happen. So you don't have a luxury of walking away and saying, okay, I'm not perfect. So I just want it. I'll just, you know, stay in my own little hole. And I want to interact with others in this spiritual, religious way for fear that I may not that it may be counterproductive. The Torah says, you must just put that guardrail up, put up your guardrail, contain yourself, but you're not free of engaging in the task of building. Every encounter is a new opportunity orchestrated by God that if you have met this person that you have to have a positive influence on. Don't walk away, just contain yourself, humble yourself. So there's a famous story that uh, that Abu had told over the years several times, which many of you have heard. The story is of the Chassid of the Mittal Rebbe. The Mittal Rebbe was the second Rebbe of Chabad. Now the Mittal Rebbe had made a rule that anybody coming to Lubavitch, the town of Lubavitch where he lived, the Chassidim would come, you know, as often as they could to hear Chassidus and be inspired. So the rule was on the way there and the way back, wherever you stopped, you had to share what you learned. You had to say Hasidus. 
So there was a particular young man who was a very gifted speaker. And wherever he would go as, as traveling to Lubavitch and from Lubavitch, from his hometown, in the places he passed through, he would go to the local shul and he would get permission from the rabbi and speak and people were very inspired. And he drew people to Hasidus. And he, so he came to the middle Rebbe and he said, Rebbe, I, I want to be exempt from this. Why? Because it's feeding my ego. I get compliments and uh, I know we do a good job. And uh, the whole point of Hasidus is to be humbler. And here it's, it's feeding my, uh, it's feeding my ego. So I want to be exempt from this. So that the middle Rebbe, Rabbi Dov Be, this is the second Rebbe of Chabad, said to him these famous words in Yiddish, at Sibelizol from Dir Verden of Chassidus Ostachazen, which in translation means an onion become of you, but Chassidus you have to say. You're not exempt. You're having a positive effect on others and you're concerned that it's not coming. So you work on yourself. It doesn't exempt you from the task at hand. And he used the example of an onion because the onion itself is inedible. But if you put it into in other foods, it enhances them greatly. So you may be imperfect and you are inedible. But if you'll devote yourself, despite your misgivings, to improving the lives of others and inspiring others, then you become useful. Then you become an onion who is put to good service, enhancing the flavor of other foods of other Jews. All to say again, you can't shy away with the excuse I'm imperfect and it's just uh, uh, feeding my ego. Deal with it, contain it, but devote yourself to helping another person with this profound requirement of this law, putting the guardrail around yourself. And now finally, we will answer spiritually why the Beis Amigdash needs the guardrail, but the shul doesn't. The answer is as follows. A shul is basically a place, we're talking spiritually now, for one's private um, communion with God and, and private uh, elevation. So when it comes to your own spiritual advancement and you have a sense of accomplishment, but you haven't hurt anybody else, not so terrible. But the base of Migdash is all about lighting up the world. The base of Migdash, unlike the shul, which is more the private place, relatively speaking, it's a place where we all go for our private communion with Hashem, for our shiurim, for our learning, so when it comes to your own private advancement, you should put, we can't obligate you to put uh, a railing there. If you're you know, taken with your own achievements, not so terrible because you're not affecting somebody else. But the base of Migdash is the Jew and his mission to illuminate the world. There, there has to be a railing. There, great effort must be made to see to it that in my influence on others, I do so in a humble way, my arrogance, my agenda, uh, doesn't come through as a source of, of irritation or uh, worse than that. Uh, what's, a, what's a good word for turning off? Turn off. A source of uh, alienation for other Jews. All right, so we're clear. We explain spiritually why the synagogue, no, doesn't have to have the railing because that's your private advancement. But we are obligated to be a holy temple. We have to make our homes a temple. We have to have influence on others. The light has to shine outwards. So there it's critical without exemption and the, and without exemption that the base, that, uh, that has to have a guardrail because here we're speaking about our interaction and effect on others. I hope this was all clear. Yes?